Hello, everybody. Welcome, beautiful people. It's so nice to see you all here tonight. Thank you for coming out today. Welcome, everybody. Please come on in. Thank you for being here. So, we want to acknowledge that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramutushaloni people, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We want to recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland, and as uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as citizens. We like to pay our respect to the elders, relatives, and ancestors of the Ramutush. We commit to being the best caretakers we can. All right, so I also want to give a big shout out to our unseen labor here at the main library and all of our libraries, and that's our amazing media services staff, our custodial staff, all these people that make this library run that we don't. Uh, please support the amazing East Wind books. If you aren't familiar with them, they are, yes, big fans. They are amazing. They've been in this community for a very long time. Buy their books, support bookstores. You can buy it now. You can buy it after the event. After the event, please exit the auditorium. There'll be some mingle time out in our lobby. All right. Um, this event is part of our One City, One Book, which is celebrating the amazing Catherine Ma and her book, The Chinese Groove. It's also AANHPI month, so it's a combo celebration. Catherine Ma will be speaking at two branches. In case you missed our main event, which was a nice packed house, she'll be at our Ortega branch June 1st and at our Chinatown branch June 8th. Um, nice little kickoff to our big summer stride as well. And then tonight we have Curtis Chin on the panel, who will also be doing a conversation Saturday in Chinatown, and this is a partnership with the Chinese Cultural um, Center. And you can find that on our website. I also have some flyers in the back, and that's going to be a wonderful event. Um, the event will be taking place on Kearney, uh, 1 to 2. But 2 to 3, I'll be down in Ross Alley doing some library pop-up, getting library cards, and I have some great books for you all to take away. So tonight we're here for Corky Lee's Asian American featured uh, celebration of Corky Lee's Asian American which if you saw it out there, it features breathtaking photos, celebrating the history and cultural significance of Asian American social justice movement. Tonight's panelists are Mei Nai, Fei M. Ng, and Curtis Chen. They're going to be recounting the legacy and discuss his influential work in reshaping narratives. Tonight's moderator is Fei Ming Ng, and she is a first generation Chinese American author and native San Franciscan. She's a best selling author and winner of the American Book Award. Ng's work has been published in prestigious publications and anthologies, and she has received numerous fellowships and awards. She currently teaches creative writing and literature at UC Berkeley and has recently released her memoir, Orphan Bachelors, also available online. Without further ado, please welcome our panelists. Hello, welcome. I want to thank um, all of you for coming. I want to thank the San Francisco Public Library. I want to thank Penguin Random House for making this beautiful book available. And also Anissa Malady for just helping this run so smoothly and technicians. And thank you for being here and we'll just start. Um, I'll introduce the panelists. Curtis Chin is a filmmaker and also a writer. His film, Dear Corky, is available now, streaming on PBS. I encourage you all to view it. Um, he has also just written a book, a fantastic 
heartfelt, humorous, deeply honest book. Everything I learned, I learned in a Chinese restaurant. And for all of you who love Chinese restaurants, you're going to love this book. Mei Nai is the co-editor of the book. She spent incredible heartfelt energy bringing this to life. Borky is her friend. Um, she is also a professor of Asian American Studies and History at Columbia University. She's the author of incredible incantatory novel, not novels, they read like novels, The <laughs> Chinese Question, The Gold Rush, The Gold Rushes, and Global Politics. It's a must read if you want to understand who the Chinese are in this country, how this country came to be. So my first question I'd like to ask, we have the cover of the book. Could I have the next, oh, let's see, the cover of the book. So I'd like to ask Curtis, who was Corky Lee, and why is this book important? This is Corky. Uh, <laughs> how many people here actually knew Corky? Go ahead, Inga. Wow. Wow, awesome. I mean, we should actually ask all of you. I mean, he was such a special person and he touched so many people. That's why you all came out here for it. Um, you know, for me personally, uh, I think of him as the Asian American community. I mean, because I was this kid from the Midwest, uh, had a very small Asian American community there. But when I moved to New York in 1990, he was one of the first people I met. And uh, I interestingly had two internships, one at the uh, Chinatown History Project, which is now the museum out there, and then also Pan Asian Rep. But I'd see him at all of their events and every other community event I was going to. And um, throughout my years in New York, but then also, you know, after I left New York and I do other Asian American things around the country, I would always see him, you know, snapping his photographs. And when I made my first film, um, I'd gone out to LA to be a TV writer, but then when I started making my own independent documentaries, um, one about the Vincent Chin case, which is a case that I grew up with, uh, having grown up in Detroit. Uh, I knew that, you know, Corky was one of the people we needed to have in that film to sort of talk about it because he was there to document that experience. And just, you know, like I said, uh, I can't think of the Asian American community without thinking about Corky Lee. The Corky was a pillar of this, of our community of the American, of American history. So. Um, May, how did this book, I mean, this was a, he had such a storied career and he died so tragically because of COVID. How did you manage to gather his work and to present it in this beautiful format? Corky left uh, a tremendous body of work. He photographed Chinatown in New York, and then broadening out Asian American communities in the, the East Coast, and then broadening out to the whole country um, for 50 continuous years. That's a remarkable achievement. And, you know, if you Google Corky Lee, you know, you'll get a lot of his photographs, but they're kind of random in a way. Um, when we put together the book, you get a historical arc. You get a, narrat a visual narrative of our community's histories. And so I think that was um, one of our goals in putting together this book, you know, to honor his legacy after he passed. Um, Corky had wanted, he had long wanted to publish his own book, and he started working on one in 2011. He assembled 100 photographs that he wanted to self-publish. Um, and, you know, stuff happens, it never, it never got published. But that was the core of the book that we used to start building the story in the book was the photos he has selected himself. So that's nice to know Corky really has an invisible glove in the creation of the book. Absolutely, so yeah. can I have, can we have the next slide please? Thank you. Um, in these photos, they're working photos, but they're also creative photos. Um, May, can you tell us a little about his background? He came from a real working class background. Um, he was devoted to family, but then he became devoted to community. Um, give us a sense of who he was as a man. Right, Corky, the, the picture um, on the left is uh, Corky and his family. Corky's the tall, skinny guy in the back row um, on, on the right uh, with his parents and his 
brothers and his extended family cousins and people from his parents' villages. All the adults in this picture ran laundries and Corky's family ran a Chinese laundry in Queens. All the kids worked in the laundry. They did all the different jobs. Corky knew how to run the place by the time he was in junior high. Uh, he went to Queens College of the City University at a time when there were very few Asian American students there. And he graduated from college in 1969, and that was during the Vietnam War, and he lost his student deferment, and he became what they call draft eligible. So he declared himself to be a conscientious objector, and he was assigned to Chinatown to work as a tenant organizer. And he, but that was a time in 1969-70 when the Asian American movement was, you know, emerging. It was bursting forward, and he met Bob Shang, and Bob recruited him into the Asian Media Collective. That's a photo by Bob of Corky at a light desk, working with slides. And one thing people don't know about Corky's work is that he started mostly being interested in creating slideshows as an organizing tool. And later he got into photojournalism and prints and et cetera, et cetera. But slides was his first medium, I believe. Bob can correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, so here he is creating one of his slideshows in the what would become known as the basement workshop, the famous basement workshop in New York. This is fascinating. Would Bob like to make some comment on who took this picture of Corky? Bob did. Bob did. So Bob, would you like to add? Um... <laughs> Hello? Okay, um, pretty simply, uh, the photograph I took there on the right was um, taken at 217 Madison. And 217 Madison back in the day in the Asian American movement was the collective. That was a a group of people who had similar goals and similar political inclinations and beliefs. And we're all trying to, um, this, is a, this is a particular shot where um, kind of represents this collective called the Asian Media Collective. So we were a body of, of media people, artists, filmmakers. Nancy, my wife here, was also included in, in the group and she can also talk about it. Um, so here, um, basically we, I made I made this uh, the slide box uh, the light box because we didn't have any money so we just put put together some some cheapo uh, fluorescent lights and then we were able to edit. Uh, at the time we were doing slideshows, and Corky was very very interested in in promoting the uh, the bad housing conditions in Chinatown at that time. So we, I think he was editing his own slides there. Um, many times we would collaborate. Other times. Corky would simply go off on his own uh, to photograph and then to uh, also lecture. Um, be besides Corky's visual acuity, he had a tremendous um, knowledge of whatever he was, you know, um, investigating. And he could tell you the history of these places. It's pretty amazing that, I th well, he was a history major. So it stands to reason that he would be able to verbalize all the you know, all the areas and all the, the people that he photographed. Perfect. Thank you, Bob Shang. Could we have the next slide, please? Hey, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So um, let's talk about how he documented the Asian American uh, movement for social justice. He did this for 50 years. Um, starting in the 70s when you weren't even born. <laughs> so um, maybe you can tell us how you came to meet him and how he inspired you or educated you. Yep. Oh, that's me, right? Sure. Okay, tell us about this picture. Yeah, so um, yeah, like I said, uh, I met him right off after I got off the train in New York, uh, you know, because he was always running around the community. Um, you know, the most that I actually spent time I spent with him was actually more recently when we made this documentary called Dear Corky. Uh, we spent about a year with him, you know, uh, following him around, uh, not just uh, in New York City, but he had an exhibit in Connecticut and then, you know, off to Utah because he did a lot of work there around the railroads. Um, and so, um, you know, he just really, uh, as to Bob's point, he just had this photographic memory, literally. Like, and when we were always talking about his photos, he knew them all like the back of his hand. He could point out all the individual people. And to me, um, 
you know, uh, one of the one of the honors of making the film Dear Corky was being able to help, uh, you know, frame his understanding of the community. Like, there's this one run where he goes from uh, covering Bob and Yuri Kochiyama to, like, you know, to Helen Zia to, um, you know, Grace Lee Boggs. You like to see all the titans in our community in terms of social justice activism. But Corky was there. He covered all of those people. You know, and I do think that for me, one of the saddest parts, um, you know, about Corky beyond just losing him as a friend is just that memory, the history that he understood, like in all those pictures. I think one of the values that Corky brought to the table was that he could enter any situation and instantly know who were the people that he needed to focus on because he had such this encyclopedic knowledge of the community. And I feel like that's probably the thing that we're losing the most. And so... Um, you know, I think the work of the book is so critical right now because, you know, there are still people around who are in those pictures who can now, uh, you know, reach out and say, hey, that's me in the photo, you know, or people who see their parents in it. And because we've got to collect that information mm -hmm. now while people are still around. And so, you know, I encourage all of you guys to buy the book, look through it, see if you see yourself in it, see if <laughs> someone you know, and then, you know, reach out to the family estate and, and help fill in the provenance of these photographs because we sadly we don't have Corky anymore to sort of do that for us but we still have people in the community who can so. May would you like to add to that because well yeah I mean I I first met Corky in the early 70s in Chinatown when I was also a young radical running around making good trouble right <laughs> like Corky and you know knew him over the years but uh, I chose this picture um, in terms of how I know Corky, because this was in 1996 at Columbia when there was a student hunger strike for ethnic studies. And I was a student. I was a graduate student at that time. Um, and then later, uh, when I went back to Columbia to teach, um, in 2019, I became the director or co-director of Columbia's Center for Ethnic Studies. And I invited Corky to come up to Columbia and to do an exhibit in our gallery. So he came up and he measured the wall space and we talked about themes and he couldn't decide on a theme because there could be so many themes from all his work. And then that was 2019 and then 2020, the pandemic hit and we never got to have the exhibit. So that was my last dealings with him. Can I just sort of add, so we, we made the good... The thing about the Dear Corky project, the one that's appearing on American Masters now, which you can see for free if you go to pbs.com, was that that was part of a larger project called Our Chinatown. We were really looking at how issues of gentrification and, you know, overcrowdedness were affecting the Chinatowns around the country. And we obviously wanted to have his voice in it. And we captured, um, you know, we've been following around for, like I said, a year. And uh, when COVID hit and we had to shut down production, we weren't sure what we were going to do with the, the footage because the conversation had shifted, right, to anti-Asian hate crimes. Uh, but then sadly, when Corky passed away, we knew we had this footage. And one of the things that we feel fortunate about is that we were able to um, show him rough cuts of the segments that he was in before, because we were about 85% done with filming. We were really close to done, so we were showing him uh, parts of it. And he actually uh, loved it so much that he was starting to show it around to people, even though we told him not to. <laughs> you know, like, he couldn't wait. Up, he couldn't <laughs> wait. So um, in that sense, I feel really good that, you know, he gave us his stamp of approval, too, much the way that he gave the stamp of approval to your book. Yeah. That's beautiful. To see the man, you know, so in love with his work. Can we have the next slide, please? Now... These are some of his last photos. No, um, his first photos. His first photos. What happened in that long history from his first photos to was there a change? Can, can yeah, you talk I mean, about that? these are um, these are some of his photos from the seventies and early eighties. You know, the Chinatown Health Fair, the famous health fair in the summer of nineteen seventy, which he not only photographed, as you can see here, but he also helped organize. Um, he helped build a booths and, you know, he got Mott Street closed. He was one of the very few people in New York City who knows how to close Mott Street. That was his talent as an organizer. Um, and then there's a famous anti-police brutality demonstration in 1975. And Corky was always um, an anti-imperialist. And this is a demonstration at the UN against Marcos. 
Right, so these are just a sample from the book of some of his early photos. We can go to the next slide, and here we've got Vincent Chin, of course. Um, he was a long uh, supporter of the Day of Remembrance by the Japanese American communities, and he photographed all of the big labor struggles in Chinatown. This was the 1982 garment workers um, strike, 20,000 immigrant women went on strike. Do you want to talk about Vincent Shin a little bit, Curtis? Um, in terms of his involvement with it? Yeah, or, or just the issue and, you know, yeah, you know um, his involvement. I mean, Well, I mean, this shows, um, uh, you know, Corky's commitment to the community, right? Because right. Um, the way he told the story. So in our film, uh, Vincent Who, which is the first documentary I made, which looked at the uh, hate crime. Um, does everybody here know what the Vincent Chin case is? Because if there's anybody here who doesn't, I'm happy to recount what it is. Is there, even if there's just one person? Okay, so in the 80s, uh, you know, the auto industry in Detroit, where I'm from, was really struggling. Um, and Vincent Chin was this Chinese American who was out celebrating his upcoming wedding. Oh, that led to a lot of anti Japanese, anti Asian rhetoric, right? So Vincent Chin was this Chinese American out celebrating his upcoming wedding. He goes to the strip club and. Um, at some point, these two white auto workers come in and they're overheard saying, it's because of you mother blanks that we're out of work. Um, they're all kicked out of the bar. Um, and uh, these two guys get in their car and they drive around the streets of Detroit until they sadly see Vincent sitting outside of McDonald's. Uh, they take a baseball bat out of their car and they bash his head in. Um, and sadly, um, you know, Vincent died, you know, several days later. Um, my connection to the story is my uncle was his best man. So it was like a really... Um, you know, personal thing within our family and, you know, growing up with it. Uh, but Corky Lee, this photographer, uh, you know, in New York City, he was working at Expedia at the time, and he heard about it because they were printing things within the Chinese press. He knew this was going to be a big story. He came out to Detroit, you know, to actually photograph it. I mean, that was his commitment to the community back then. Um, and so when we, when I wanted to make a documentary that looked at the Vincent Chin case and the impact that it's had on the development of an Asian American consciousness, I knew that he was one of the key voices of that time period, you know, who we needed to include. And so I feel very, uh, you know, again, fortunate that he said yes, and he shared his, you know, memories of it. And uh, yeah, you name a name a major moment in Asian American history, and he covered it. I mean, he right, really was right. there for everything. Yeah, and he um, probably went out on his own dime. Um, I also heard that these um, men paid somebody twenty dollars to find Vincent Chin. So the movement that Corky, you know, he just got there, you know, because he knew, and also he had no fear. He was going to capture this for history. Yeah, and he, he was uh, telling us how, you know, in the uh, giant rallies, he would go and he'd interview people because he also loved to, you know, hear people's stories because I think that helped him inform the photographs, right? right? Because for him, it was really about the people. And so... And he captured you know. Mrs. Chin in absolute naked grief. That was such a moving photo. Okay, can we have the next slide? Ah, uh, this is a very famous, iconic. Case. I think this is probably one of his, this and the uh, railroad photograph are the ones that I see the most being mm, used. Right, right, I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is obviously uh, post 9-11 um, in New York City. This was the rally that happened, I think, what, three or four days right after? It was a Saturday after 9-11, which I think was a, so it was a vigil in Central Park. Yeah. Right, by and, Sikh Americans. And so, like, you know, he knew that he had to go cover it as part of the community. I think he may have started off mostly covering Chinatown, but he understood the importance of a pan-Asian coalition. And so, you know, he would cover things throughout the different parts of the Asian American oh, community. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was pan-Asian from the very beginning. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I think what um, this photo, I think, is especially poignant because <clears throat> you can interpret the man's fa his face differently depending on you know, you the viewer, right? Is he defiant? Is he grieving? It's not obvious, right? But, he, but Corky's capturing something complex. And, and what he's capturing at this moment when the nation is grieving after 9-11, but so many people are turning their anger at Sikhs 
and, uh, and Muslims and people who appear to be Muslim. Um, and so wearing the flag became a shorthand for people to say, I'm not a terrorist. But you could also read it as um, a kind of statement of assimilation. I mean, it's a lot of meanings that one could gather out of that photo, and I think that's a reason why it's so powerful, because you can read multiple meanings in it. And yeah. you have talked about um, Corky composing um, photographs. Do you know anything about how this I don't know came how. To be? Well, he, he was very skilled at composition. Um, I don't know that he posed these people, but he composed the mm -hmm. photograph mm -hmm. very deliberately to show a range of people, the guy in the foreground, the girl. Mm -hmm. I think it's, this is a real masterpiece, I think, of his um, artistic skill. And he also, you can sense these people trust him. Mrs. Chin trusted him. The girls in the bathroom trusted him. And you've always asked, how did he get into the bathroom? They <laughs> trusted him. <laughs> yeah, he has such a warm personality. I'm sure all, everybody here who's met him, you know, here can attest to that, right? Um, and the wonderful thing is he'd always remember everybody too, you know, and I think that's part of it too, why people trusted him. Yeah, I would, yeah. I would venture to say that he didn't just snap this photo. Mm. He probably talked to people, asked them why they were there, you know, talked about 9-11. So, and then he asked them, can I take your photograph? So he wasn't just like a photojournalist going around snapping photos. Yeah, he would engage first. He would engage yeah. with them, and that's how they would trust him, I think, because he could see his sympathies. Well, this tells us a lot. He's a story, he cares about story. He's a storyteller through visual art. He's also, he's able to capture stories, secrets, private stories, private pain, private pride. So this says a lot about the man, right. the artist. Great. Can we have the next slide, please? OK. So this was during the pandemic, uh, 2020. Um, Corky, uh, Corky would say Asian Americans are victims of two viruses, the coronavirus and racism. And he took a lot of pictures during that first year of the pandemic. He always wore a mask when he went to Chinatown. He couldn't really go anywhere else because of the travel restrictions. Um, and he wanted to show with his photographs that Chinese people were not the cause of the virus. They were its victims also. And he showed the community. So here there's a neighborhood patrol passing out leaflets to merchants, telling them to put signs in their stores about wearing no, no mask, no service. That was the slogan back then. Um, and then, of course, he covered the protests around racism. So there's a lovely series of photos in the books. He asked people to pose in front of their famous Chinese restaurant that was closed, because all the restaurants were closed. So we have four photos of people posing in front of restaurants. But he took a lot of them. And I've been, some of the early book talks we went to, I met people who told me, oh, he took a picture of me in front of my restaurant, but it's not in the book. But I went and found it and sent it to them, and they were so pleased, right? So, you know, because we had the whole run of those, that series. So, um, you know, he was really trying to show the resilience, you know, of the community, you know. And then he caught the virus, you know, in December of that first year. Yeah, he says, uh, I, I, I didn't hear from directly from him, but I heard through the grapevine that he said that, you know, he even guessed which rally he went to where he caught it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's why. Uh, mm. I feel like this is... I feel like this is really significant because the tale that Corky likes to talk about is like when he was a young kid and um, they would, you know, they had these photos of the uh, promontory point, you know, uh, and it was all white people. And that seemed to be a thing that really drove him early on in terms of understanding the erasure of Asian Americans within history. And I feel like, you know, he was always set to like right the wrong. And I feel like that's why, for me, when I look at this, this makes me actually think of his childhood, you know, and being that young Asian American kid 
and recognizing that his history is not being told and feeling like, wait a second, you know, where, where are our people? Where is our part of the story? And to me, that's been his journey in life, right? He was trying to correct that wrong, and he did. So, you know, he would have these regular get-togethers, you know, every, during the anniversary, um, and uh, I was fortunate to go to a couple of them. Um, but, uh, you know, he just always had so much joy when he was in Utah and all the surrounding and the environment and all that stuff. And I know the people in Utah really love him, too. He's, I feel like they have adopted him even as an honorary. I think that's true. Yeah. That's true. I mean, in that photo, there are descendants of railroad workers, direct descendants. Um, Corky not only photographed this, he organized it. Yes. He put out a call, you know, after his decades of photographing communities and knowing activists all over the country, he put out the call and he says, let's all go to Utah and right the wrong of our being erased out of, you know, I mean, if Chinese Americans know nothing about our history, they know one thing, which is that we built the railroad, right? If you only know one thing, that's what we know. And as Curtis said, Corky always told that story about being in junior high school and not seeing the Chinese. So for him, this was his uh, really, he considered this his most important work um, because of its, uh, he said it was his work of photographic justice. And I think, you know, so he organized it. And then for the next five years, they went back um, and did other reenactments. Um, and they also had a little pilgrimage to the site of a Chinese camp, a laborer's camp. Um, there's a lovely photo in the book of a Buddhist monk praying at this rock formation where the Chinese laborers uh, set up camp. And there's been some archaeological digs there to show that they were Chinese there. So anyway, so Corky thought this was his most important photo. But to just build on what you're saying about him being an activist, because they were in uh, Utah, and the killers of Vincent Chin live in Nevada now. <laughs> he would always try to get people to like just make a side road trip down there to say, we should just go protest in front of this guy's house and stuff like that. You know, but that's the kind of youthful spirit that he always had right, with all right. of his stuff. Yeah. Well, it's also majestic that he not only, I mean, how many, we've heard so many people say there are no Chinese in this picture, but they don't do anything more. And this is where his activism comes true. He did something. Right. Uh, he did. This is extraordinary. Just the, it's monumental. The effort beyond the thought, you know. And this is what we should teach our children. <laughs> you can observe and you can note, but really do something. Do something. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We have the next slide, please. Ah, David Henry Wang, fresh off the boat and Ang Lee. So, Corky was involved in civil rights and immigrant rights um, in familial devotion, but let's also consider how he forged and captured a new perspective on art, culture, and the political power of America, because his photos are changing a bit here. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, he he was very much, um, so we just looked at a long run of photos, basically protest type photos. Um, but he also was a chronicler of the Asian Americans' participation in the arts, also protesting racism in the media. Um, so he was at every performance of Pan-Asian Rep. That's uh, the kind of, um, this the, Pan-Asian Rep's uh, revival of Fresh Off the Boat um, in that picture. Um, and he was, you know, captures Ang Lee giving an interview, I think, about um, Eat Man, Drink, Drink. drink. Uh, um, so, you know, he was at all of the cultural events, too. And I think the book also shows a kind of uh, evolution of Asian Americans' presence in the arts and culture, as well as their protests, right? Yeah, yeah, and I want to say something about Corky. He was so progressive and so inclusive um, in, in his oeuvre. I mean, he understood the importance of storytellers, you know, and um, I like to say that, you know, when, when I'd moved to New York and I co-founded this group called the Asian American Writers Workshop, it was a totally new group. We were all just a bunch of 20-something-year-olds, but we invited him to cover, cover our events, and he was always there from day one, even though we were, you know, not a well 
organized group at that time and stuff like that. And to the point of his inclusivity as a gay person, like he was really great about covering LGBT events too. I mean, he just was really, um, had a very open, kind-hearted way of looking at the community and very generous, yeah. Great, let's have the next slide. Right, so as I mentioned, you know, Corky also covered all the protests against racial stereotyping in the media. You know, Year of the Dragon was this film that reduced Chinatown to a gang, gang violence and gangs, and um, that's David Dinkins, who would later become the mayor of New York. Um, and that picture protesting Miss Saigon on Broadway, that one Corky sold to the New York Times, that, that got printed in the Times. But that um, Miss Saigon was, I think, a real watershed in Asian American um, actors community about um, you know, who would be casted in theater and in films. And if, if people don't know, in Miss Saigon, um, they had Jonathan Price, a British actor, play the male lead in yellow face and with eye prosthetics to make his eyes slanty. And this just made everybody furious. Um, and Tihua Chang told a story when we had a book event in New York that this was, um, this Miss Saigon protest was controversial among people in the Asian American Journalist Association, which Corky was a member of, because there were members of AAJA who wanted to protest the Miss Saigon. And there are others who said, if we protest, we will no longer be taken seriously as journalists because we're supposed to be so-called objective. And it was a big controversy among the activists. So Corky was on We Should Protest on that side of the divide. And Tihua, who was an investigative journalist for many years on in broadcast television on the East Coast, he said, I was on the other side. I was on the professionalization side. So it's an interesting look into how this controversy you know, how it reverberated at many different levels among Asian American activists. But don't you think that Corky would say that he's an activist first? Yeah, yeah. He called himself an activist photographer. Yeah. 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 Do we have the next slide? Ah. So oh, these are um, family oriented, they're community Our festivals. Yeah. Yes. Um, so we see the range, you know, he was, he was protesting, but he was also so clear about the joy that is in the community and the con continuation of family, the development of Asian American family. Um, did you see this in Corky, the, the private man? Uh, the idea of joy or? He gave so much because he would go to these festivals and he would document the joy. So tell us something about who he was personally. He had a big family. He Well, he came from a big family, many siblings. Um, he was married to a woman named Margie for m over 25 years, and she passed away uh, from cancer. Um, they never had any children. But he was always close to his brothers and um, their children, their families. I think Corky's family was the community. And he had many friends. He would go to these heritage events. Um, you know, it's interesting. When we put together the book, I wanted to include photos like this. This is Oban Festival. That other one is an interesting story. It's a Chinese girls drill team in Seattle, which started in the 1930s. But Corky, uh, the editor said, well, why do you have all these festival pictures? Why are they, you know, we don't need to have that many. They wanted mostly the protest photos. I said, no, these are really important because Corky believed that our cultural heritage is part of our communities. It's part of us honoring our ancestors, how we practice our culture to continue our heritage. It's about representation. So the editor got it. She said, okay, fine, you know. But what I like about these photos is that you can tell they're Asian Americans. They're all wearing sunglasses. They're wearing sneakers, right? I mean, it's, it wouldn't look like that in Japan, mm -hmm. right? And the drill team was started as um, 
a uh, uh, kind of girls club project in the <clears throat> by a Chinese American restaurateur in Seattle, and it, you know, they perform um, like military drills, and I didn't, you know, I had to do a lot of research, like what was that costume? And I had two research assistants working on like what was that costume? Because <laughs> it's not an Asian ethnic costume. They adopted that costume after Chinese opera women warriors. It's a Cantonese opera costume that they adapted. And that makes a lot of sense <laughs> right. because the Cantonese opera was um, the source of joy and entertainment. And I wanted also to consider that because of the almost destruction of the Chinese American family, the fact that you made sure these family photos were included, and it, it really documents the history of family in this country. Yes, yes. Um, the near destruction of family, and uh, I find them very moving, and I find his ability to capture the joy in the opera singers, um, this is unique. Yeah, yeah, they're lovely. Can we have the next? Yeah, and he liked to show juxtaposition. Corky loved juxtaposition. Part of his um, skill at, as a, as, at composition was to show beauty pageant contestants with the American Legion veterans, right? And to show Filipino, that's the Filipino Harley Davidson Club at the San Francisco Philippine Independence Day Parade. He liked to show that Asian Americans were Asian and American. And it wasn't a contradiction. To him, they were both. It's like why you can dance at an Oban festival wearing sunglasses and sneakers and why you can have Filipino bikers at the Independence Day parade. He was always showing you the Asian and the American, and I think that was a constant theme of his. And it also seems that he's making a statement that, you know, they can mm -hmm. have their feet in both cultures, to create a new culture, which is the American culture. He was really staking a claim right, in these right. photographs. They're dramatic, they're powerful, and they're proud. All these people are filled with pride. Right, his subjects are never abject. Mm -hmm. They're always real human people, yeah. And they're having fun. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Okay, so these are amazing photographs. Um, these are the old, the low walk you in, in our country, the old bachelors, what I call the orphan bachelors. Um, they are the backbone of, do we have? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the mailboxes show you um, the crowded conditions, but it also shows you, you know, they're all written in English. <laughs> Um, so they're written for the postman. They're not written for each other. Um, and I find that so smart. Like, they don't need to write it in Chinese because everybody knows where you live. There is no need to identify, but the postman may not know, or the FBI may not know. So this is the kind of, he captures, there's a curiosity and a sneakiness and a defiance in these photographs. Um, and. I am really interested in these because May and I are confession and exclusion babies. We were born before 56, which is the con confession program. And, and Corky was a confession baby. Exactly. His father was a paper son and a confession. Exactly. And Curtis here is way too young to be either <laughs> exclusion or confession. You were born in 65, and you were when the Immigration Act changed everything and an influx of skilled, not laborers, but immigrants came in. So what did, what did Corky see um, in that kind of shift in citizenship? Yeah, I think the, the unique perspective that Corky had was somebody who was born at the tail end of the exclusion era and the Cold War, and then he witnessed the vast changes in Asian American communities, right? So he was both somebody who experienced that change, also chronicled it, 
So I think that's, that's the history of the community. And he documented the low walk you, right? The, uh, the guys in the park and on the street, you know, they're, they're not together, these guys. They're separate, but they're together, mm -hmm. right, on the sidewalk. And he was able to capture that kind of sense of the Chinatown that you don't really see anymore. And exactly. And let's just note the um, ham, the American Virginia ham on, on one side, and the very Cantonese, you know, dried, salted something on the other side. And you look around today, and everything has become glamorous and packaged and very, like, anime. This is so unique, and right. you captured right. that. Curtis? Uh, a response to it, or, or being a <laughs> the youngster here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the baby. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just thinking about, yeah, he must have observed that. And I, well, it makes me think about his connection to the working class. One of the things that I do think about, because my family's been here since the 1800s, mm -hmm. right? And my family's more of a restaurant family. But, um, you know, when 65 happened, the Hart Cellar Act and the immigration pattern of the Chinese or Asian American community radically changed from being a working class community, right? Which is what I feel connected to in part you know, versus one that is more college educated. There's a class element to it. And so that's why I feel like, you know, maybe we had a kinship because we both felt like we're from working class, you know, Chinese American backgrounds with a strong connection to Chinatown. Um, you know, and I feel like that's why I think as, um, as artists ourselves, you know, the palettes that we both covered are very, very similar in that sense. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I think working class is another thing that really defines this perspective. I think we need to move on. Next slide, please. Well, that's another iconic photo of Corky's, the inside of a garment factory in the 1980s, I think. And that's a senior center in Oakland, Mahjong game, um, Amtrak conductor here in California. And that's Corky's uh, wife, his late wife, with her mother in their family's laundry in New York City. So he really wanted to capture everyday life in the community, not just the demonstrations, not just the parades and festivals, but ordinary people living their lives, working. Yeah. And I know how these people are looking at Corky, and it just says so much. Mm -hmm. They trust him. They are showing their two selves the Mahjong player, um, his wife, um, the lanky butcher. You know, nobody's afraid. Right. He's an insider. And, exactly. And, and that is so, that, that's not something that's just given. It's not how photographs are taken today. You know, people capture you, but he is given access to I'm going to say that one Chinese lady is like, don't look at my cards. <laughs> 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 we just have one person. Who Cheater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chinese people are very, very tight about looking at their cards. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> okay, let's, um, let's have the next slide. Um, oh, so I chose these photos to show Corky's um, skill at composition. Um, the one of the, that's the uh, Da Chong Hong uh, Dragon Boat team after they won the Dragon Boat race in Flushing, New York. It looks spontaneous, right? But he actually asked them to pose, right? But what comes across is their joy and their exuberance at winning. And the other photo I love because, you know, you look at the photo and you, you should be asking, how did Corky get in the girls' room? He met these girls at the Chinese Methodist Church dance. Um, they had come in their prom dresses because you don't want to just wear that dress once. You know, you wear to the church dance. And he said, let's take a picture. Let's go into the girls' room. And we've met these two of these women recently who've seen the picture in Arlen Huang's show. And they said, oh, yeah, we remember when Corky got us to go in the bathroom. And they said, you know, none of us were smokers. So... <laughs> <laughs> and the one with the cigarette has told us, I want you to know I'm not actually smoking, <laughs> just lighting it. So, but he wanted to show Chinese 
teenage girls are cool. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I can imagine Corky showing them how to do it. <laughs> I don't know if he was a smoker either, but she knew how to do it, right? <laughs> Next slide, please. Crossing Canal. Can you tell us how you chose the photographs? Because Oh, all... yeah, I, I already mentioned that in the beginning. You know, we started with the 100 photographs that he himself had chosen uh, for his own book that never got published. Mm -hmm. um, and then we added photos for the last decade of his life that he chose to show in exhibits. So again, these are photos that he selected as representative of his best work. And then we found some hidden gems, some stuff in the slide boxes that nobody has ever seen. So the next one is our surprise one. That's the Black Panthers mm. at the Ewar Kuhn storefront in Chinatown on October 1st with Chairman Mao in the background. <laughs> so. One thing I would say about Corky is that he was very generous with sharing his photos with people, mm -hmm. too. And so that's been a good and bad thing in the sense of um, he was also, um, in fairness, wasn't that organized about his photographs. And so in terms of when we were making our film, we had to do a lot of work in terms of reaching out to people in the community saying, hey, you know, what do you have that's out there? And fortunately, you know, people were willing to come forward. But I feel like there's also, you know, probably lots of other photos do. So I would encourage anybody again here who knew him, you know, if you guys have photographs, you know, um, don't necessarily assume that we have them all yet. So maybe you can reach out to the family and say, hey, here's some other photos that maybe you may not know about. So I mean, we might find some other gems in there, I think. Yeah, Corky, Corky had um, uh, a practice where he would take photographs of an event and then he would go back to the event's organizers a week later with a disc and say, here's, your, here's the photographs I took of your event. So he was very generous in that way that you should have a record of your, your events. So that's how we got a lot of photos for the, for the book. Yeah. And if there are people out there who do have some of these things, please you know, come forward and, and please share with the estate. Great, and we have the next slide. Um, so as a man, I like the idea that he wasn't so much in love with his art that he wasn't an accountant. He wasn't, you know, going home and documenting. He was just doing it out of a deep love um, a deep, and a deep concern. So um, we're going to go back to where we started. Why has this project been so important and how do you see it moving forward into the future? Uh, what is his legacy? May? Well, I, I think his legacy is that he, Rene Tajima Pena says, Corky wrote the first draft of history. He was a documentarian. He covered everything, um, all the major markers of our community's growth and our struggles. He captured all of that. And I think by putting together this book, we tried to offer the public that first draft of history as he saw it. Um, and I think we can learn a lot from him. And I just want to say, you know, Corky was, he died at the age of 73. He was a little bit older than me. Um, you know, Faye and I are OGs, right? <laughs> but young people love Corky. You know, Curtis's film was so popular on college campuses. And we got a, an endorsement from uh, one of the girls of the Linda Lindas, mm -hmm. who said, Corky is inspiring to us high school students. And we just signed a contract with um, another part of Penguin Random House of a woman who's writing a children's picture book about Corky called Scene. Oh, that's beautiful. So there is another generation or maybe another two generations of Asian Americans who I think are identify with what Corky's quest for photographic justice was. Well, I, and, well, can I, well, yes, I want to ask, since we were running out of time, what is some private, who was he when the, the camera was down? Well, can I, I'm going to say something to add to you. Um, what I want to say is uh, there will never be another Corky Lee, right? Because just the way we uh, consume uh, photographs right now, he was the singular person going to all these events, right? But because of cell phones and cameras and people taking it, it's, it's just dispersed and in some ways that's representative of the times that we live in so in that way I feel like you know we're not gonna you know Corky was singular in that sense at least you know in my 
opinion. But anyway. Well, can you share now the man without the camera? What, who was Corky when he put the camera down? You both knew him. Can you share some parting memory, some parting image? You know, there was um, somebody wrote, I think it was Rocky, that he had a grumpy uh, personality. Or, you know, he wasn't grumpy. Well, who wrote that? He was grumpy. So, uh, he was good. That. I didn't write it, but he, <laughs> he, he could, he could be curmudgeonly. But I don't know if that's the same as grumpy. Well, give us, give us a, a, a private memory so we could see who he was as a man when the camera was down. Corky, Corky was a storyteller. He loved to tell stories. He loved to see the juxtaposition in things. He loved to see the irony in things. And um, I think it was Jeff Yang, somebody, or was it you? I don't remember. Somebody said he went out with Corky to a Chinese restaurant, and Corky is a Chinese American. He's an ABC. He couldn't read Chinese. So he said, he at a Chinese restaurant, he said, I'm the, um, oh, God, I'm, he said, it's, uh, all, the all-American, authentic, fake. Mm. <laughs> As a Chinese-American, he was authentic, but a fake. And I think that's how he was able to look at himself and look at the rest of us as well. Um, I, I, you know, I think as with any artist and the community or the subject that they cover, it's a very complicated relationship always. Um, there was no doubt that he loved the community and always centered it, it seemed, in my opinion, in his life. That's how he oriented his life. Like, he'd wake up and say, what am I going to cover now like, for the community, right, of right, the community? Right. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, with any struggling artist, right, you don't make a lot of money. And so the realities of that situation is, is how do you, you love your community, but at the same time, you know, uh, I think it would have been nice if the community you know, had also, it's great that we're getting all this stuff now, but it also would have been great for him to see it. And I hope that he, I, I really s sincerely hope that he knew how much that the community loved him, you know? Uh, and I don't know. I don't know if he felt that all the time. I think he, he knew the community loved him. I knew he had a loving relationship with the community. Uh -huh. But I think he also felt he didn't get the respect he deserved from the mainstream mm. media. And that was a cause of, um, he talks about that in your film, right, of some resentment on his part. So now we have this beautiful book published by mainstream media, and it's sad that it's only with his passing that he's getting the respect, I think, that he always felt he, sh he should have had, and he, of course, that he deserved. So. Well, I want to encourage everyone to get the book. It's a beautiful book. Um, I think we're running out of time. Or is there time for a, a few questions? Time for a few questions, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Audie Chang. I saw the uh, PBS uh, documentary, loved it. I thought it was just really touching. Uh, but the, I noticed that Corky was talking to the camera about his life. And I wonder whether any of that was scripted or uh, did you have a lot of footage that you just had to cut it back that was... Uh, no, no, he was just being raw. Yeah, I think it's that connection between... Me and also my DP, Ken, who's also a Chinatown kid. Uh, there's just a trust level. He would open up in that sense. Yeah, no, it's not, it's not like it was scripted or he would say, like, take a second. Because he gets teary-eyed, you know what I mean? So um, it's all genuine. That's how he felt. Yeah, I, I yeah. really saw a side of him, you know, that we talked about his wife, his first wife, and the fact that he never really had a real job, right? Uh, is that right? <laughs> so he had a job. He had a day job. He had oh, a day right, job, right? Guy. He did have a, and his, but his wife definitely, I didn't know her, but she did seem like to be his rock, the person. Because, you know, in every relationship. She had, a re she had a regular job, right? Yeah. With the health insurance, right? Yeah. In every relationship, you always have You need somebody the with the health insurance. Yeah. Right? Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, it was very tragic the way it came across for him. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It really says something about the man. There's a question back there. Yeah. Um, at some point, I'd like to take a selfie, if you guys are all up for it. Uh, so if you have a copy of his book, to hold it up. And it's something we can post up on the Corky Lee uh, Estate page, if you guys can. Uh, yes, my question is uh, with regard to his interest, if not intention, 
to uh, 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 publish a book, okay? And uh, in the PBS film, if I recall correctly, I was kind of astonished to hear that he said, I'm not this, I'm not that, okay? And I think he said, I'm not a writer, which astonished me because you say he loved history, he loved hearing stories, telling stories. I would think that would be a natural, particularly as an artist, I'm always intrigued in reading about an artist and his or her work, what was behind it, you know, well, what did they see in their work, et cetera. So was it maybe he never got around to writing, uh, to putting out a book because there was this thing that maybe he didn't feel as skilled a writer as he was a photographer? No, the book that he envisioned was a photo book with simple captions. He did not envision um, a book that we produce, which has a lot of, a fair amount of text in it. Okay. Right. We, we took as our job to represent his photos, but to put them in social context and a historical context. Corky was, wanted to do just kind of a portfolio of his work. He didn't finish it because... We all start things and we don't finish them. <laughs> I don't think it was, you know, he was a busy man. Yeah. One last real quick question. When Bruce Lee made his appearance on the American scene and given his voice, ethnic pride, Bruce Lee, and a few other things, I was wondering, was Corky Lee moved by that? And did he go out of his way to maybe be around Bruce. Uh, take Not that I know of. I don't think um, I've seen photos of Corky, or that Corky took of Bruce Lee. But I will say this: I mean, we included that picture of Ang Lee, the movie director, and we have pictures in the book of Cork that Corky took of famous people like Maya Lin or um, Yo Yo Ma. Corky did not like to display those photos. He said, I take pictures of these people because they're at events and it's part of our community, but I identify with the <clears throat> grassroots people. I don't, I'm not into presenting celebrities. That was his choice. So there are a lot of photos of celebrities that we included in the book because they're part of the record, and, and that's why he took them. But the book that he prepared didn't have any so-called famous people in them, and that was his his kind of class bias or his choice. One more? One more, sure. Just, just real quickly, again, I just want to give uh, a chance for Bob. Uh, again, Bob sitting in the front. Uh, him, he himself, a photographer, and also known cocky since they were young, young uh, <laughs> radicals. I, I'm just wondering, uh, there was a question about, you know, cocky's personal story, personal story, anything that has not been shared uh, tonight that, uh, Bob, you want to shed some light uh, to add uh, more to the picture, because it's so fascinating. Again, uh, I highly endorse the documentary. I also saw the documentary. It's fantastic. So I just want to give Bob a chance to add a couple more, uh, you know, antidotes that he would like to uh, share with us. Do you want to tell us about Corky the Man? Let me or bring you the, the microphone, angry, Bob. Young, angry young man. I'll, I'll make it brief. Um, when I met Corky, I had just uh, uh, finished school at University of Buffalo in New York, New York City. I'm a native New Yorker. Went up to Buffalo to study uh, as a Chinese American pre med student. Ended up being a photography major, art, photography, poetry, history. Uh, the turning point was when I, I took a course in, in Chinese history and I really got into the subject matter. Um, and then Vietnam was happening. This is around 68, 69. Uh, prior to meeting Corky, um, I, I left Buffalo um, basically as, as a photojournalist who covered all the political um, events going on, on on campus and in the city of Buffalo. Uh, war resistors, uh, anti-Vietnam uh, protests, and so that was my background. And then I moved to New York, and I met Corky Lee. Um, 
also met a, a group of act, young Asian American activists uh, at a place called Chicken Ho Chickens Come Home to Roost, which was an uptown uh, storefront that was basically, we were squatting there, um, um, and they were organizing for um, housing rights uh, in the Upper West Side, where people were being um, evicted, basically. So I met Corky in Chinatown, um, and we started a Asian Media Collective, which is a group of photographers, uh, filmmakers, and uh, people who wanted to show another side of the news. Now, we weren't exactly um, qualified news people, but we noticed that in the mainstream media, there was nothing uh, describing the life and times of Asian Americans as immigrants um, you know, struggling in this, in, this, in this country. And with the, the impotence, impetus of the Vietnam War, and the, and the black power movement, and all the various liberations move, all the various liberation movements that are happening around 68 to 1970, 71, um, the, the collective wanted to, to um, basically disseminate more, more information and knowledge and visuals to the community. And that's where Corky kind of just took off from there. He got the idea right away. And this is sort of like, this is really what I want to do for the rest of my life. And so I didn't see Corky after 1974, but I knew that he was um, basically unstoppable as, as, a, as a photographer, as somebody who was motivated by very powerful convictions about what he was doing. And so you can see the result um, 50 years later um, of his work. Um, I have nothing but praise and um, his amazing ability to to um, to be basically um, every day getting up with his camera, going out, uh, walking the streets, finding new subject matter, uh, finding new interesting people, and then recording it in his mind as well as on film, and being able to recount everything that he had seen and and done and recorded is really phenomenal. I think he was he was part genius in in that sense. And you got that sense when you talked to him. And you said to me, you said, you said to yourself, my God, this guy knows an awful lot. He knows everything about everything he ever took, practically. He's like Mr. Storyteller, okay? So that's, that's where I see Corky in, in the history of Asian America right now. He, he's really, you know, thrown that torch really high. And it's, it's really to the rest of us to, to sort of like keep him in mind and in spirit so that we can continue his work. Thank you, everybody. And Curtis, I think you want to take a selfie? Uh, OK, everybody hold up your book. Can we, can we borrow your book? <laughs> everybody hold up your book. If you didn't buy a book, if you didn't buy a book, go buy a book. Don't fall off the stage. Thank Yay. You. Thank you, everybody. Yes.